some images of what I'm going to be talking about. So if the man up there can roll the film for just two minutes, uh, we'll turn the lights out. Now this is an old movie, and it flickers a little bit. of a trip through a model that's uh, 30 feet to the inch, made by undergraduate architect at Berkeley in about 1972. And it was part of a project to try and develop more realistic ways of showing the physical environment to the general public. It was a project that was a basic research project Don't worry, you won't get hurt if we run off the road. It was a basic research project that was financed by the National Science Foundation. Careful there. To test how realistic we could get. I did this project with a psychologist, Kenneth Craig, and he showed this film to 200 people from the, from the neighborhood where this was in Marin County. And he took 200 other people through the real life place. And he asked both of the groups uh, what they saw, what they recalled, what their attitudes to the place were. And essentially, they responded in very similar ways. Correlations about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 between the two sets of responses. Now, some people said that we'd, uh, we'd had a police car going ahead of us to stop all the traffic. And that does have a certain unreality about it. There isn't anything moving aren't any people. But then in the real suburbs, there aren't too many people either. Like the neutron bomb has been here. Okay, well, I think that's enough of the movie. If we can turn the lights on and uh, you can turn the lights on, yeah, good. Okay, this is going to be a multimedia evening, so things are likely to go wrong every now and then. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about the effect of research on practice, and then, uh, as I say, I'll go through the history of that media project and the kinds of things that were show you the kinds of movies we're making right now, because that was a research movie. My life has been uh, moving between uh, practice and research and education for about 20 years now. I've also moved between architecture, landscape architecture, and city planning. Um, and I call myself an urban designer. I'm sort of between fields a lot of the time. Um, some of the problems with research, uh, I wrote about in a paper some years ago, um, especially social science research, is that it's just very difficult for social science research to be uh, communicated to professionals. Social scientists don't usually know what the relevant issues are, and professionals don't read research anyway. So that on both sides of the communications link, there is, in fact, a fairly substantial gap. Uh, what is good research? Well, I just put down some criteria for what good research can be. Um, good research has to identify uh, relevant issues. So you've got to have a nose for what's the problem. 
And that doesn't mean necessarily relevant issues that professionals perceive as relevant issues. They're quite often issues that are relevant to that public out there. And a lot of the time, it's the professionals who are the last ones to change. Uh, I'll give you an example. I've done a lot of work on the effects of traffic on street life, on residential streets. Now, this is something that highway engineers do not perceive as a problem. Uh, I'm coming out with a book on that this summer. It's really going to be addressed much more to neighborhood groups, to the public in general, with an effort to try and get them to put pressure on the highway engineers who still believe that streets are for facilitating the automobile. So, a lot of research isn't always directly directed at professionals, but also at, at a public who is concerned, though, about the physical environment. It's trying to identify problems that are important to people out there about the physical environment. Second problem with research, or second kind of criteria that research really needs to fulfill, I think, is that it has to be conceptualized in a comprehensible way. Uh, you have to deal with theories, in other words. Um, the problem with an awful lot of research is it just churns out data. And there is just a tremendous amount of data now on how the handicapped feel about their environment or, or um, how uh, old people perceive the city, things like that, that require an enormous amount of reading. Uh, but there isn't that much research or thinking about uh, conceptualizing these things. There aren't too many theories around, except what are embedded in the heads of all you. You have a whole lot of theories about what the environment means to people. You don't even know you have them, probably. Uh, you probably think that if you, you paint bright colors on the walls of a room, people will be happy, for instance. And this is a kind of environmental determinist set of theories that the professions have been pretty uh, much in love with for a long time. Our whole identity, in fact, depends, seems to depend on that. Well, that's a partial truth. And a lot of our theories, which are based usually on our own experience and on what we would like the world to be like, uh, which would give us a nice role in it, uh, a lot of those theories uh, are not really substantiated. They should be brought out of the closet, in fact. We should look at them. We should try, try to get some better ways of understanding just basic concepts about how what we are doing, what kind of roles we as professionals are playing, what our relations are to our clients and the public, and how the physical environment operates in all this. And I'll show you an example of a, of a conceptual model on the slides in a moment that will give you an idea of what I mean. Um, third, communicating research to professionals in an engaging and meaningful way. The problem with research, as I said, is that most of it's locked up in environment and behavior. And uh, may I ask how many of you read environment and behavior? How many of you ever heard of environment and behavior? Environment and behavior is the main uh, journal which publishes research on the physical environment. And as you see, I can tell you about seven of you put your hands up. Uh, it isn't getting to Muncie yet. And it probably won't be because it's a very dry kind of journal. It's not a very interesting journal. It's the social science, basically. Um, research should somehow penetrate the professional's way of doing things. In other words, if you're going to try and change, and most research has been successful when you simply added something to what the professional does already. Like you now begin to think about the handicap. You sort of add that user group on to all the other user groups that have been added on in the last 10 years. Uh, but that hasn't perhaps changed your fundamental way of thinking about things. Changing fundamental ways of, of approaching things depend really on getting into ways of explaining a new kind of design process, how you might do it differently. The design methods group tried to do this. Uh, with varying success in the last 10, 20 years. Chris Alexander is trying to do it by sort of setting a number of patterns or guidelines for how to do things, rules by which you can follow, which you can follow to design designs. And uh, sort of adding a lot of criteria or objectives to the way you design. The actual way he talks about designing is more mystical than the, than the, than the 
guidelines, but the guidelines themselves do sort of start to up on a certain track. Um, it's very difficult to introduce new technologies, for instance, this evening. And I will be talking today about a new technology, basically. Uh, it's very difficult to find professionals adopting new technologies. So I wonder how many of you use the computer in designing projects, for instance. How many use the computer in designing projects? Now, you see, computer graphics and computers have been talked about now for 15 years. Uh, and everyone says, well, in five years' time, everyone's going to use it. And they're still saying that. And uh, it may be that nobody will ever use it. Maybe engineers will use the computer. A large architectural firm is going to use the computer. Planning firms are beginning to use Not planning firms, but some planning agencies, regional planning agencies, are using the computer for rather everyday tasks. They're not taking over the whole of the design, as uh, Negro Conti sometimes uh, decided will with it. Um, we have also tried to, as I say, introduce new technology, the making of movies, for instance, to explain schemes to the public. And I found it just takes, there's just an awful lot of inertia in the design and planning profession about adopting new technologies that way. And I think that that, I still haven't resolved why that quite is. I think partly it's because uh, people have a sense of professional identity that's based on what they learn in school, on learning graphics and being able to draw and that's such so much of the core of a professional's identity or the writing of reports that any new technique is somehow threatens that. That may be one reason. Another reason I think is that professionals seem to live, at these days anyway, uh, at the kind of survival level. One hears again and again, well as long as we can just get this project accepted, as long as we can get along, you know, as long as we can just survive, that's good enough. We can't, we can't really afford, we're a poor professional, we can't really afford to adopt new ideas, new technologies too much because uh, you know, we don't have the resources, we're not like engineers and so on. Um, the fourth aspect of research that might be worth talking about is one way of including research into uh, design or planning is in fact to do on-the-job research, which is not basic research, but quick and dirty research. Research that you can do as part of a project. You can find out what people want. You're just talking to people. It's a certain level, a crude level of research, but it's uh, a whole lot better than not talking to people. Uh, talking to people about uh, the potential plans of a building or the citizens who are involved in approving or disapproving of a plan, uh, just communicating with them, uh, listening to them, uh, is a sort of research, if one can make any sense out of what you hear. And that depends on you as much as that. OK. Now, I'm going to illustrate some of those points, I guess, through the kind of research that I've been doing on environmental media over the last uh, 15 years or so. I'm going to show you some slides from way back. Let me say a few things about professional media. I'm talking now about plans, sections, elevations, perspectives, axonometrics, slides, computer graphics, models, uh, slides of models, films of models, right? Lots of the whole range of things that media that you use to design buildings or design cities. The whole central activity of professionals that visualizes the future. Without That's the only way you can get to that future is by representing it, simulating first of all. Uh, but that whole simulation process is very problematic for us. For many professionals, it's a kind of transparent thing. You don't even notice it anymore. You learn how to draw in school, you do your drawings, and you can imagine what that building is going to be like. You don't even notice that your drawing is in, your drawing is not the building. Some people even are satisfied with just doing the drawings. Uh, you get it published in progressive architecture, and who needs the thing built? It will only leak. Uh, so, uh, we are getting more and more kind of media satisfied. You know, 
as long as you get recognized in the profession, and the only way to get recognized is, is through the journals, not through anybody visiting the building, uh, the media have begun increasingly to dominate our professional lives. So although to us they are transparent, <coughs> they are also quite dominant. Frank Lloyd Wright said, when architects began to draw, what is when architects began to draw, architecture was lost. And in Hokkaido, you know, he had a point. Uh, the fact is, though, that we can't deny that media are the only way to design most of the buildings, most of the cities we have. We can't just go out there and build the things anymore. Society's got too complicated. While the media are transparent to us quite often, they're often a barrier for the public. The public does not understand plans too well. The public doesn't understand uh, axonometrics too well. They can't visualize themselves in these things. So for them, uh, the media are often a barrier or a deception, uh, deliberate or otherwise. Um, you've got these cases of people who, uh, well, there was a case in Buffalo recently where $400,000 was given, allocated to building a wall around the main city park, I think it was, a major plaza. And uh, they got the thing half built, and everybody was up in arms against it. So uh, they spent the second 200,000 tearing it down again. Uh, clearly, the simulation of that project was not very effective. The public did not know what they were going to get. Or maybe it was only shown to a very few people. But the whole business of letting the public know what is going to happen to their city or their environment beforehand, before it actually goes up, uh, is an issue that we should be more concerned about. We who are inside the design process don't realize what it's like to be the outsider. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, problems with media today. Uh, one is the lack of credibility that a lot of media have. Professionals, the public are worried increasingly about being uh, deceived by advertising and by professionals. Well. Um, so we have a credibility problem. Uh, in fact, uh, we sometimes deliberately encourage that problem by deliberately deceiving people about what our environments that we design are going to be like. I'll, quote, I'll show you some examples pretty soon of the way we glamorize projects. Often not deliberately, but nevertheless, we're glamorizing. Well, my first concern in this, and I'm going to start showing slides, I think, pretty soon. Yeah, I think I'm going to, yeah, let's start showing slides. I'll show you the movie. The next movie I'll show you somewhere in the middle. My concern at the beginning of this media saga was uh, with realism. And let's see, I have to do, I've got to hold two things here. I'm not used to a double tick. Are you focusing this or am I? Can you focus the left hand one? Yeah. Okay. Okay, on the right there is a typical site plan of a housing development. And this is the kind of site plan that to a professional may mean something if you really look into it, but to the public means very little at all. There's just no way of telling what that place would be like to live in. I mean, it's just very difficult to imagine. And that's a relatively three-dimensional plan compared with a lot of plans. Now, the diagram on the left is, was my kind of first response to that problem. I'm missing out a lot of intermediate steps here. This was a plan for a road, and it came, comes out of the book, The View from the Road, which was done in the early 60s, which was a, an effort to try to describe experience through a, a notation system. Uh, it still didn't show you what the real environment would be like, but what it did try and explain, this was a a highway around Boston, 
And the freeway, this is it, designed in around 1961, when the, when the Innerbelt Freeway was probably going to be built. This notation system shows such things as when the road is wide here, that means the road is high up above the ground. So it's kind of three-dimensionally foreshortened. And so this part here is where the road descends. And these other arrows are simply views, right? And so if you travel along this piece of road, you get a view of this building from there to there as you travel between there and there. So it shows you when you get a view. Uh, this is when it's enclosed. Now this diagram, therefore, is trying to explain the space, motion, view, characteristics of traveling around Boston on a road in this direction. So, as opposed to this, which is a kind of sculptural diagram, uh, this one is trying to describe experience. However, it's trying to describe it in a rather esoteric way, unless you learn the system. Now, Lawrence Halpern has done diagrams like this too. Ballet, uh, choreographers do diagrams of ballets like this. Um, and they work. It is possible for these things to work. Um, one can, in fact, produce very beautiful diagrams. This, for instance, was a design of Boston street system, a redesign of Boston street system, showing uh, the information you would get on each highway coming into the city about each destination. These were the destinations were in different uh, zipper tones, and this is where you could see them. This is still a very abstract kind of description of experience, however. And in that same book, we began also to look at more concrete kind of images. We had on the bottom corner of the book, we had a flicker sequence. You could flick your way through uh, that whole trip from here to there to there to there to there to there to there to there. To there. This is a sort of a stop frame movie of the design of that street system that I showed you before. And that uh, was in many ways much more meaningful, certainly to people who were unskilled in the notation system. So I began to give up on the notation system. I'll give you some more examples about uh, problems of professionals and the public's having different perceptions of the same place. Mm -hmm. Now, in the early 60s, I worked on the plan for a new city in Venezuela on the Orinoco River. That's the Orinoco there. This, in fact, is a diagrammatic plan for that new city. This is a, a, a steel a hydroelectric and aluminum city, a heavy industrial city. Uh, there were about 30,000 people when we started working on the plan, and today it has 400,000 people living there. And uh, the plan uh, essentially was for a linear city with major centers here, there on top of the hill, and I won't go into the details, but it was a linear city along the line with the old so. original settlement and the steel mill. The point I want to make here was that I interviewed about 300 people in this city and asked them to draw a plan of the city. And their plan, this is one of the better ones, but their plans were totally different from the plans of the planners. Now, whereas the planners' plans always drew the river in first, for instance, the two rivers, and then drew the city in afterwards, uh, the people would draw the city in first, and then sometimes they could draw the river outside it. Most of them just drew uh, the main road with little, little traffic islands and things that were very important to them. Their experience of the city was very much oriented to the street system itself. So they, in fact, were concentrating on a very different kind of city from the one the planners were. And the planners were using that image because they worked mostly from plans, from aerial photographs and plans. In fact, there were on the aerial photographs, there were a number of hills which had labels on them. And we thought, ah, oh, these are very meaningful hills. Nobody in the city knew these hills names. Only we who had seen the aerial photographs. So it became more and more clear to me that the media that the professionals were using was affecting their perception of the place. And that the media were, again, putting them off or creating some kind of gap between them 
and the local two. Okay. Um, we tried uh, to reorient the project around uh, around the perceptions in a way. On the right hand side you see a diagrammatic design of the main road of that city. And very much like the view from the road drawing the floor before, looking at views and uh, where the center would come as you approach the city, the city itself. I'm right? talking about this. This was the main road to the city. And it's starting from here. It would actually bend right and left. And you catch views of the two rivers on each side. And each time you would see, uh, you would pass at an increasingly large center until you arrive at the main center. So the whole, uh, the, the major design of the city was designed around this uh, principal road. And this is a, an early photograph of that road. Uh, so uh, we began, therefore, to, at that time, I was beginning to use uh, highway design as a way of structuring the design of cities. And that's the city today, actually last year. Uh, we designed that center to be visible on the skyline and uh, it certainly is. We designed the whole center of the whole city to be, to tell a certain set of messages to the population who were there. Uh, okay, that's just background to the story I'm going to tell you now about trying to simulate better the future environment. And this is the first simulator that I worked on. This was built at MIT in about 1955. And we had a model, and we had a groove in it, and we had a movie camera on a little train here that ran with a periscope peeping up through the model that ran along that road. And we did that because we were concerned about, let me see what I can do here. We were concerned about uh, a periscope uh, not being able to go through bridges. And the whole thing was a failure. Uh, because as you see what happened, uh, it was like traveling through a sea of lava here. Uh, but uh, you must realize, that the idea is I'm trying to show you that research doesn't always succeed the first few times. Uh, so that we scrapped that and we bought a simulator that uh, they had uh, built at the University of Yale in about 1967, 1968. We bought it from Yale and this was it. And they were building quite large scale models. 20 feet to the inch, and uh, they have this overhead uh, gantry system. We dismantled this and pulled it across the country by truck. And uh, we made our first movie with that system. Uh, and it was uh, a movie of an automated highway system, actually for the Ford Motor Company. And, uh, we had these cars moving uh, on this. Uh, single track system. They all moved at about 60 miles an hour electronically separated from each other. And uh, essentially it was a movie that showed how a new technology, what it would be like. Uh, we traveled, we couldn't actually travel in a car on the system because the gantry was too wobbly. Uh, we could just fly around it. So we did make a, uh, a videotape of uh, what it would be like. And that videotape was so uh, successful that we got funded by the National Science Foundation to build this uh, monster on the left hand side here. So this is slightly out of focus, I think. Can we try the, can we get this a little more focused? Uh, uh, well, I guess that's all right, yeah, that's fine. Right. Uh, the principle behind this system is very straightforward. Uh, we have a, a model scope here and a television camera, or you can put a movie camera or a still camera on here. And that movie you saw at the beginning was taken to this model. That's a view, that's a video, that's a view through that television camera there. Uh, we made this movie by taking stop frame uh, shots along this road. This is 30 feet to the inch. Um, actually, we, we first of all, Put the television camera on here and decided what route we wanted to take. And then we have a computer that digitizes that route and takes the, uh, the movie itself. Uh, this gantry is about 27 feet wide and can go up and down a room about 50 feet long. 
So we can place that uh, periscope anywhere in a pretty large room. Um, we usually have one or two or three models down on the floor at any one time. Now, let me see where we are. There are some better pictures of it. Um, this, uh, this has a series of lenses inside this, this periscope, and uh, it's about a tenth of an inch radius of the bottom, so that you can, in fact, get down to five feet high on a 50 foot of inch model, which is very small indeed. Um, it can just about fit on that roadway. We have another periscope that is um, slightly narrower and somewhat more sophisticated. It can pitch and roll with the road itself. Um, on the right hand side, you see a rather poor photograph of the sections of the periscope if you're interested in technology. I can't really show you too much, but just a series of lenses in here with a, a little uh, rotating mirror at the bottom. The mirror can be moved, and that's what allows the uh, allows you to roll and pitch. And here is the control room of the lab. The model's over here on the left behind the cyclorama, and uh, that's the uh, that's the video uh, view of the alignment of the road. Uh, as I said before, uh, the funding for the National Science Foundation was actually to do research, first of all, in how realistic we could be. So we took a real site, which is this one over here on the right, and uh, it's North Marin, not North, Central Marin County. It was the United San Rafael, Carolinda, just north of Frankfurt, right? Uh, uh, county building, and uh, it's, a, it's an area that's varied enough. It's a suburb, it's got industrial park, uh, in it, a commercial strip, a freeway, hills, and so on. It's a very varied site, and that was really chosen more for the psychologist needs to get a site that where you could plan, uh, simulate different uh, kinds of environment. This is a uh, schedule of what the psychologist did with these 200 uh, groups of 200 people daily. Um, I won't go through this in any detail, but they essentially spent the whole morning from, well, they, did the, they took a tour, which took about half an hour, from 9 to 9.30, and then they had to answer a whole lot of questions about that tour, from what kind of mood they felt uh, it had, to um, a free description of it, to a list of noteworthy features, to a sketch map, to trying to draw what the configuration of the roof was like, and so on. In other words, if people see a movie, can they orient themselves in the environment, for instance? Uh, we found that was rather difficult for people to do. Uh, all this helps us when we're trying to orient people to a new project. If you just show a project at eye level, uh, they're likely to get disoriented. So one does, in fact, have to show overhead views as well as ground level views when people people to understand it. Okay. Um, that was the uh, map they were given, and they were asked to respond. This is a map of the area, and they were asked to respond to, uh, to characterize the different parts of this to see how well they remember each part. And here are just uh, one or two pictures of how the model was made. The model was different from the normal model. It was made by, um, it's really more scenery. We took photographs of buildings, uh, coded color photographs, what they call it, prints were just stuck on the front of these buildings, and that's what you see there. Uh, it, it ends up with a very realistic kind of, at eye level, a very realistic kind of uh, uh, scene, much more so than the usual abstract one. Now, uh, that on the right is a model, uh, an etching of the kind of street furniture we created for that model. You see there are lots of stop signs and street lines. So we did do some inventive work on model making, but uh, uh, the model that we made was in many ways cheaper than the normal model that has to be looked at and looked correctly from above. It only had to be looked at correctly from eye level. So we saved on many aspects. We didn't have to do the backs of everything. Now, getting into some of the uh, theory about media, uh, this is quite an important matrix here that's going to we'll take a long time to go through. I'm going to go through some of it, though, if I can read it. Um, what it's trying to look at is um, 
down the left hand side are all the media I talked about, from verbal descriptions to plans, sections, elevations, to perspectives, to ground level perspectives, photo montage, sequences of perspectives, uh, abstract models. By that I mean models that don't have uh, you know, the just their, say, wooden models or plaster models. Um, naturalistic models, which is the kind we're making, which actually shows what it would look like in terms of color and texture. Computer graphics, both linear computer graphics and colored. And then model simulators, which is what we're using, using slides or video tape or films. And here, we're talking about the main criteria for a good simulation medium. Now, here are the principal criteria. And they are realism, in other words, the, the, uh, the medium, the simulation should look like the place is going to look like. It should feel like the place is going to feel like. Uh, accuracy, and it should be uh, correct in the way it does that. Comprehensibility, in other words, people should be able to understand what they're seeing. And that often is in conflict with realism. An awful lot of those bubble diagrams and so on are understandable in a conceptual way, although they're quite a long way from what the place would really be looking like. And I think most professional media have sacrificed perhaps too much to comprehensibility and too little to realism. Uh, engagement. Most people are pretty bored by uh, many professional presentations. People are not exactly excited by a plan. Uh, so engaging people, getting them interested, is, uh, is an important counterbalance to the kind of apathy you get in a lot of public hearings. Uh, costs next, both initial costs of uh, getting equipment and production costs of each production are very important. And finally, flexibility. Uh, one would like a medium that could be changed quickly, or if the public don't like something, or your clients don't like something, you can go back and change it. A drawing has a great advantage here, but you can change it very easily. Some models can also be changed quite easily, other ones can't. Okay, given those. Um, uh, criteria, uh, we look more closely at realism. And one way of looking at realism, there are two ways. One essentially is to ask people whether you think it's realistic. Or like we did, show them the real building and show them the drawings, and, and do they respond in the same way? Uh, the other way is to try and see whether you can visually replicate the building in some way, or the, the project, or whatever it is. And that depends on accuracy of all these figures, things here. Accuracy of detail, of textures, of tones, colors, uh, width of the view field, uh, the number of viewpoints of a single perspective uh, gives you a pretty erroneous view of what a building yeah. or a project is going to be like. Whereas if you can, a model you can look around, or we can drive around, or walk around. The more viewpoints you can get, the more realistic you like to get. Uh, Three-dimensionality, that is where a model has a lot of advantages. Uh, one could also go to stereoscopic images and things like that. Um, movement, uh, either self-motion self -motion or animated. In other words, uh, our movies are successful in a way because you move through them. You play some role in them. Uh, they're not just dead models. The model comes alive to some extent. Uh, better still, if the model came alive itself in terms of, say, other people in it, or walking, uh, or cars, or some kind of moving in the model. And I'll talk to you in a moment about how we try to get animation into models. I can have an animation view. Uh, sounds, the real sounds. Again, uh, uh, most presentations have no sense of what the noise is going to be, no sense of what the noise is sound the place would be like. Uh, other presentations, of course, do that in a deceptive way. I've seen pictures of projects with you know, birds singing in the background uh, instead of the probability of traffic that you would get. So, okay, all these are uh, qualities of the visual image and this of the acoustic image that together can create a realistic simulation. Uh, they can also be used, as I say, to deceive. So there's no, this is a double-edged sword. 
Uh, if you look then, and this is a totally unbiased evaluation, you will find that model simulators do better than anything else by a long way. Um, I can't go through every detail here, but where you have a big black circle, that means you can do it pretty well. Um, what it's saying is that a verbal description has very little realism in it. Uh, in terms of visual images, although in fact, of course, as you know, a lot of people can actually uh, weave wonderful stories around projects if they have a very uh, kind of silver tongue and, uh, and make a project seem much better than it really is. I've seen that happen. Uh, but here, I just I evaluated that as not a very realistic kind of uh, simulation. Uh, but the ground level perspectives are realistic in some ways. Uh, photo montage has realism, but it doesn't have many viewpoints. It's not three-dimensional. There's no movement, for instance. Uh, natural models are fine, but again, there's no movement. Uh, the difference between what we're doing and the more static graphic presentations is that one, I guess, that we can, we can move through a model, and we can have the model move. And computer graphics can do this, too. However, computer graphics, most of the time, has produce only very cartoon-like images. It cannot produce very good textures and details. Uh, the tones and colors are getting better, uh, but those are coming on at enormous expense also. So it's not very available. And so one goes on. These, uh, in the end, although these are set up here as competitors, uh, the ideal, of course, is some kind of combination of media when you're presenting a project. You show people a plan, and then you, you take them through, say, a sequence of slides or a, a videotape through it, and then you go back to an axonometric, you know, you combine them so they get that three-dimensional, or rounded, over time experience of what the place will be like. Uh, the right-hand column deals with the setting with, within which one has to produce these media. And I'll talk about these a little more in a moment. But, uh, either, uh, through the newspaper or through television or the public hearing of a small group, uh, you may want to use different media that you will in those different settings. For instance, here, the black and white line media are much better in the newspapers than usually than models are, quite often the models are. They don't have color and so on, etc. Uh, television, certainly, uh, model simulation really works very well. In the public hearing, uh, these films can work pretty well, but slides and so on can do too. Uh, and in the small group, uh, video, uh, interactive video is often the most successful uh, technique than um, formal movies and or formal slide presentation. Okay, that's taking you through the piece. Now, let me get on to another issue besides realism, and that's what I was talking about before, uh, the issue of persuasion. And the fact is that uh, professionals don't like to think of themselves as persuaders uh, or advertisers, but the fact must be faced that that's what we have to do a lot of the time. We are in the business of selling people, or you can say in a better way, educating people, right? Uh, ideas, uh, our ideas, our projects. We therefore do not usually show our projects uh, under uh, heavy rain conditions, say, or with the uh, trees not yet grown up, uh, or the mud still on the site. You know, we show our schemes 10 years down the line, hopefully when all the trees are beautifully mature, uh, the sun is out, the clouds are scudding across the blue sky, and so on and so on. But every scheme looks like it's facing California. Uh, that's not the reality, as you all know. Uh, but this is the, that's the reality of media. Uh, here, for instance, on the right hand side, it was speaking for uh, an ecological community, quote, for about 2,000 people, uh, which is apparently you know, totally embedded and absorbed in that California hillside. Now, that is pony that project is not going to look so nice as it does there. But so that was the project shown to the public. Uh, let me show you another scheme here. This was a large building, uh, set of buildings in San Francisco. And uh, 
As you see, it's quite near the Bay Bridge. Now, the views of this building by the architectural firm were always from the best angle, the angle that made it look uh, the best. Uh, this was actually a very sizable slab building. You can see if you look at it twice, that is a very wide building. And that building is quite high, but you see we're not taking it from the ground level, we're looking at uh, a point where it doesn't really rise very much above the Bay Bridge, does it? Okay, let's see. Now the slab building now is totally just seen end on. You see it there, you can't see it hardly. Now it's taken it from an angle where this building groups with all the downtown towers. See that? It's also in direct line with the street grid, right? Maximum harmony is achieved. Now look at it from another angle. Uh, this was a, admittedly an opposition view of that same pair of buildings. Uh, you see it uh, much darker than it probably would be, but you see that the great kind of hulking mass against the, uh, the Bay Bridge. Uh, just to give you an idea of how different views of a place really can reflect people's different political viewpoints, and in fact uh, can quite easily uh, deceive the public into what a project would be like. Uh, maybe it's time now to show the second movie. This is my is the movie cameraman up there. As soon as he's ready, we can show it. I'll go on meanwhile. Uh, this is this is my uh, Theory of the role of no, not at all. Uh, supposed to be the movie. media for designers in a design review situation. Here, you're going to get the movie first, okay? Uh, it's a sound movie. Somebody put the sound on. The sound needs to be louder. Can we start the movie again at the beginning to spare? Can we ask this again? I think we have to go back. If we can go back to the beginning, it would be better. He doesn't mind. I, go, I want to go back to the beginning because this was the latest movie we had done, and it's rather. I, I give me a time to introduce it anyway. Uh, but it does relate to the high rise buildings. Um, we made this movie just this last quarter. Uh, a bunch of students made it under Peter Bosselman, who runs our simulation lab now. Uh, about 10 students in three weeks made this movie, and it was shown on all the local television stations. And the, uh, the movie was uh, made to explain uh, the nature of a new proposition, which was to control the heights of new buildings in San Francisco to 20 stories. This proposition was up for the uh, vote in November, and uh, the, uh, the developers and the unions and so on were opposing it, of course, quite strongly, while the environmentalists were, uh, were behind it. And we decided, uh, we had worked with the planning firm to try and predict what the effect of this proposition would be like over the future of the city for the next 20 years. Uh, what would San Francisco look like in the year 2000 uh, under the proposition versus being uh, development taking place under the current regulations. And uh, we scripted this movie to be shown on television. It's about a three or four minute movie. and. Uh, we tried to be uh, unbiased. We tried to be informative. Uh, although most of us uh, were really in favor of the proposition, we weren't entirely in favor of it because it was a very simplistic kind of proposition. Uh, but it is an instance of how uh, we can use the simulation lab we have right now to communicate to the public an issue that it normally doesn't know very much about. Uh, what was happening by this time in the election uh, on the television and radio stations was that the, uh, the developers had poured a massive amount of money into uh, musical advertisements, 
essentially that said, that sang out, oh no, 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 on proposition of oh, some little catchy tune. And that was the level of uh, information the public was getting uh, about it, uh, the effects of this proposition. So, I may have put it back to the beginning, but I wanted to show you the front part of the book. We, uh, this is our really first good experience at scripting a movie, and it really was quite interesting. First of all, we had to decide what role we were going to play. And as I say, we had a lot of debate about whether we should advocate for a proposition or whether we should be a kind of neutral informants. And the city got very scared because they knew we were going to show this movie and the board of supervisors was split and the mayor hadn't announced one way or the other. And uh, they saw this movie being you know, somehow influential. The second question was, Slides on. Yeah, I was, I was uh, just saying we, we had a lot of um, experience in structuring that movie and how to present an issue to the public in the space of essentially three to four minutes in terms of how to catch their attention with some kind of exciting introduction, uh, how to uh, state what the major alternatives were, uh, give them some sense of history, uh, introduce the problems and uh, finally wrapped up with what we thought they should do. 
And uh, we actually had a press conference, and about uh, seven television stations came in. And they all took fragments of it, some for the news and some for public affairs shows. I must say, they didn't use it uh, with a script at all. They just took pieces out of it. And in some cases, they biased it in their own way, uh, sometimes not intentionally. Most of the time, they confused people. Uh, the, the differences between one from the proposition and the alternative were shown slightly too quickly, as you probably didn't catch it in the film. Uh, shown too quickly for people quite to grasp sometimes. So we probably made some mistakes there. But uh, they, also, they also confused it even further, and sometimes you couldn't tell whether they were showing the proposition or the kind of regulation. OK, let me go on. Uh, that's really a kind of planning scale use of simulation. I have another movie that I'm going to show you at the end of a couple of our architectural projects and how we used it there. But let me get more into uh, well, first of all, as I promised to talk about a moment about the, the interactive si situation when you present a project that may be worth your thinking about. Um, the proponents of a project, this is a communications model, the proponents of a project, the client or the agency of professionals that you, are often the opponents to also present uh, projects, uh, essentially are dealing with a kind of three-part system. They have a storage of information, data about the project or the plan. Uh, might be in a computer or in books and reports and, or a basic model or something. But the presentation itself, they use media. They could use slides or whatever. Within that, with, those media work within a format, a presentation format, which is a kind of a script. Now, how are you going to show those slides? Or what sequence are you going to show them in? Uh, and all of that takes place within this larger simulation setting. And the setting itself, as I said before, really can affect the success or failure of the media. Uh, I've tried to show movies in rooms that have no white walls and no way of blacking out these, you know, the, the windows, for instance. Or uh, uh, very small rooms uh, with too many people in them and everybody too hot. All those simulation setting characteristics really affect whether people will understand or not understand the scheme, will agree with it or not agree with it. And actually, professional firms spend a lot of time setting up these simulation settings so that people feel good and comfortable. And uh, I can tell you some really fascinating devices that some people use. Um, and then finally, on the uh, other side of the communication flow, are the evaluators, the city council, the commission, the users, maybe, of the neighbors, uh, or the general public at large. These are the people who are likely to be more critical about your presentation. These are the people who are demanding information. And their intentions are therefore very different from yours. Your intentions are, in fact, as I said before, to educate or persuade to sell your ideas. They're, theirs are for the truth. They want to know what it's really going to be like. And my, my general feeling about whether simulations are going to become more realistic in the future, I think, depends very much on this side of the communication model. Is the public going to demand to know more about projects before they're saddled with them? Because there is no incentive, really, for professionals to do this. So there is very little incentive. Uh, these groups have certain feedback mechanisms where they can question or veto projects so that people have to come back and show the scheme again, and so it goes on. A lot of the uh, communication is bypassed through uh, social uh, contacts and the news media and so on that can often distort the nature of the presentation itself. So that people are getting two or three channels of messages about a scheme that may uh, change their minds in relationship to it. Uh, I have an article which is here called Understanding Professional Media that explains the, the role of the different group of people in this model and, and talks about that matrix as well. Now let me just show you, as time's getting on here, I'll show you a bunch of projects that we've worked on that try and do this, uh, uh, try and engage the public in different ways. Um, the first one was actually not using model simulation, but uh, collage. And this was a uh, 
a plan for open space in a community in the Bay Area, San Rafael, where we showed people about 120 slides. This is in the city hall on the right-hand side there, where the Open Space Commission actually each of them on with a voting switch where they could vote in favor or against uh, simulations of projects that were like this on the left. Uh, they were uh, offered uh, five alternatives on each piece of open space, and they had money to acquire only some of these pieces of open space. So we were simulating what it would be like if they didn't buy them. And so we were simulating on the left there if they had garden apartments on that hill, uh, versus on uh, the right hand side if they had uh, sort of single family houses with a fairly high density. Uh, each person was given a, uh, a plan with the different pieces of open space that they had choices to make, and these were the three there, and four there, and so on were the choices on each site. Uh, they were shown three slides there, four slides there, and so on of each site, and they uh, used that simulation. As I say, they voted. Uh, in favor or against these different alternatives. And then they use those votes as a basis for discussion. The simulation, the vote wasn't their final decision, but it was, uh, it was just a vote that really provoked. This was about 25 people. This was the Open Space Commission itself. Uh, you couldn't do that very easily with a large public. You have to adopt a more formal kind of process like the film we showed in San Francisco, where you can't really get public feedback except through the, the main vote they make at the end. Although there have been movies made in New York where people are asked during the television program to vote, and they can phone in or they can sign a questionnaire. But uh, at this smaller group level of 25, you can get people you know, responding immediately. The idea of the voting switch is that they can respond anonymously rather than putting their hands up, so there isn't great pressure on a minority to conform to the majority. Now, there's the voting switch, and there's the person who's on. Okay. Uh, on the right-hand side, the, the whole series of projects we did on the Berkeley Marina, starting with a very abstract kind of game. We made a model of the marina. And uh, here there was uh, the, it's a relatively undeveloped marina on the side of a dump. And uh, these were just going around the table with about 10 groups in the city. These happened to be the great Panthers on the right there, um, who were coming up with their ideas of what they would like to see there, and then they voted on them. And from that, we made a videotape. We made a larger model, something like the model on the left, but not quite so large. And we made a videotape of uh, alternative kinds of activities that could be take, take place in that arena. Some of them from a model, even from a model, and some of them from real life places. And then those were shown at every community hearing in the official process that followed that. On the left hand side, this is another series of, uh, of neighborhood interaction projects dealing with uh, the redesign of uh, streets in Berkeley, redesign of street space in Berkeley. And uh, this model is, of, uh, is about uh, eight feet to the inch, I guess. This here is a model of a street park. There is a road there, actually, and here, too. This is a real neighborhood in Berkeley. And uh, this piece of model here was inserted. It's a piece of styrofoam base. And it's the compromise design after about uh, eight different people in the community had, re had designed their own. They, uh, these were the neighborhood leaders. They uh, worked out a common solution. We did videotape of what they would look like. And the final videotape was one that was uh, been shown now in City Hall. Uh, that's the typical kind of, this was a successful model because it was both realistic and flexible. People could move it around. And they were able to uh, change it. We had a big kit of parts. We had fences, uh, greenhouses, uh, all kinds of street control devices and so on, which they could put into that model. They didn't have to do a lot of drawing or model making. They could do it. They could cut around if they wanted to, but they had these parts they could use. Uh, that on the right-hand side is a sort of abstracted uh, flow diagram of the four stages that that project uh, went through, from showing them videotapes of what could be done to the neighborhood to offering them a model kit to the final uh, videotape, which they presented to City Hall. Um, 
on the left hand side, uh, I have a movie made of one of these models. This is perhaps Ray Lipshay is one of the more creative uh, faculty in the architecture department who has students in their first model, first schemes they do as design studios is to uh, make uh, houses or dwellings for themselves and their friends and people they know. And they have to make photographs of themselves. And these are fairly large scale, about four feet to the inch. And uh, they, they build these buildings from the inside out, basically. And uh, I think we'll have time, hopefully, in the end, to show a movie from that. This is a more formal kind of use of the simulator. We're making a, a model here. We're making a film here of a new town uh, on, uh, in the town of Richmond, in the North Peninsula. And the movie at the end uh, shows that uh, the movie we made there. So if we have time for that. Uh, on the left-hand side, an interesting story. Landscape students bring their models into the uh, lab to have uh, just colored slides made of them. And with this set, uh, a number of the students didn't recognize their own scheme when they were seen at eye level. It just shows how different it is when you get down to the scale to, uh, to looking at a model from above. Um, these are research proposals. Uh, one on the right is a script uh, starting from the bottom, moving up, of uh, converting a community to solar energy, uh, showing a trip through that community, and showing it changing over time. That's the storyboard of that movie, basically, with uh, uh, shots of the major okay. issues in it. Okay. Uh, on the left, Side uh, two. this was a big project we were learning about, which didn't happen, it would have been interesting as a basic research project. Solar uh, very much. heated uh, Should have post enough. office. Yeah, it's only halfway through. Show it to the public, get their reaction to it. Then two years later, after the building was built, go back and ask the same questions to see whether we could really predict how people would react to building before it took place. It's one thing to compare existing building and existing uh, uh, media. It's another thing to see whether you can predict what's going to happen. Um, okay, on the right hand side is part of a slide from a model of downtown Los Angeles that was made as part of a research study of how old people perceive the city. And this was done through the U.S. University of Southern California, uh, the Geriatric Institute there. They made a videotape of this model and showed it to old people to see how well they could orient. They wanted a, a standard kind of model to uh, the debate. On the left hand side, is a project that is looking at visual impact of different kinds of building on the California coastline, systematically varying uh, qualities of the buildings, like the function, the color, the size. And I'll show you a series of slides from that project. Same view, same setting, different buildings. So which of these, which, the question is, which of these have the greatest was most compatible with this environment. And as you might guess, the one with the, the color was the most important quality. So the color relation, the red and white buildings were seen as very incompatible. Uh, the color, the green natural color buildings were more compatible. Even though they were sometimes larger, they were seen as more compatible. The color seemed to be more important than size, up to a certain size level. Uh, actually, people from the East Coast uh, thought the lumber mill was much more appropriate, while people on the west coast thought the hotel was much more appropriate. Uh, this is a picture of our San Francisco model. Um, oh, there is another coastal model on the Santa Barbara type coast. The first one was on Big Sur coast. We have two coastal models. Uh, you see, on the left hand side, you're seeing stills from a report on San Francisco downtown plan. These stills were made from these perspectives were made tracing from uh, still slides of our model at island. They can make those perspectives much more quickly than that's the same on the right hand side than they could by trying to construct them. I've got a series of slides that go through very quickly on simulators of different kinds uh, that I don't think I have the time to show you. Uh, I'm really running out of time. Well, uh, on yep. the right, okay. The right hand 
slide is the last slide of the San Francisco sequence. We've just got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to make uh, three more movies as part of the next phase of the San Francisco downtown plan. This is Fed Way Cook, leading planning firm's uh, diagram of the planning process as they see it. And um, this is getting a pretty hairy looking process here, but basically it starts at the top with a set of uh, uh, alternatives for different aspects of use, transportation, and physical form. We come out with three main alternatives to downtown. Uh, we would simulate a film at this stage showing what the basic alternatives were, simulate the three chosen alternatives, and then finally these will funnel neatly down into the one final plan, and we will simulate that one at the end of the process. In other words, we will make a film at the beginning of the process, opening up what the issues are, a one in the middle showing what the major alternatives were, and at the end, showing which one the decision makers, citizen committees, and so on have selected. And each of those will be shown on public television. That's if, that's if San Franciscans can agree on anything. Uh, on the left, then, uh, is uh, one of the more sophisticated kinds of simulators. When we were starting off, there are much more sophisticated simulators in for airline pilots and driver research. UCLA has a driver simulator where they actually project 140 degree movies and they have a car in the lab and you can drive uh, you know, down a freeway uh, as if you were really there with the car around you. So the simulation setting is more realistic than simply sitting in a chair as you are looking at a film of the trip. You're actually in an automobile, in fact, you can drive it. Uh, we never went to that level of realism. That's probably more important for research than it is for uh, Work, but you get this kind of view projected onto the windscreen of your car. Uh, the airline simulator is there on the right, again, the same kind of thing. They fly it uh, on television into onto a, mo a war model that I showed you just before, and uh, they're really testing uh, pilots' ability to land uh, without crashing the plane. Um, on the right hand side is one of those uh, airline simulators now converted to looking at street signing systems. Now on the left, let's see, uh, I'm going to go wrong. Go back. No, I'm going to go backwards. Uh, too bad, I guess something like If we go backwards, it would be good. Um, we keep going to the left, we'll see forward. We should be going backwards. Can we get it back? Yes, we're going backwards now. Backwards a little more. Okay, uh, what now back, I think? Yes, okay. In Europe, uh, there are a lot of simulators used by architectural schools now, especially in Holland, uh, in Germany, uh, in Israel has some, and in Sweden, and in England, and in Australia, and in New Zealand. Uh, in the US, there's only one out at the moment, and that's the Bryce University. Uh, they read the Rice Center revive this. Uh, some of these simulators are really quite cheap. Uh, there is one on the market that is quite expensive, about 30000 uh, That's the Abana Scoop on the right hand side. It's used in the Dutch Housing Institute, the Dutch Institute in Holland, to test the new housing scheme. Uh, here, are some of their, uh, here are some of their efforts to simulate the housing project. Uh, they use these simulators mostly for research. Um, this is a, a research use of Simulator. This is in the University of Lund in Sweden. This happy little man drives through this model here. And uh, his eye movements are checked on some uh, video recorder here. And uh, his rating of the scene, which can go up and down, is recorded on this little uh, seismograph kind of thing here. And this is the periscope going through the model. Um, and that is the, that is the uh, simulator we have at uh, the University of Lund. Um, and that's the grinding thing on the right there. Uh, on the left here, you see uh, in Germany now, uh, the public has to be informed uh, in great detail uh, about the impact, the visual impact of new projects, especially in historic cities. And so, especially at the University of Stuttgart, uh, they're producing very realistic simulations. This is the 
These are alternatives uh, for competition for the Central Council. And uh, these are high level views of uh, some of the competition uh, for finalists on the right there. This is the existing class, I think. That's a finalist on the right. And I think uh, here's another finalist on the left. These are highly detailed models seen at eye level. These are only slides. Um, this is the, uh, this is getting towards the ultimate. You don't get very good images here, but it is possible to put people into model. Uh, if you have, uh, here's a, per a periscope with a model seen. This is coming out of Hollywood. And here is another television camera with actors. Now, if those actors are on a blue background, uh, they can be mixed, very neatly mixed with this scene here, and those people can move in the scenery here. In other words, we can have people walking around the model. Um, Hollywood likes this idea because they don't have to make full-scale sets for soap operas. But you could use this for uh, other things. And this is uh, a very poor reproduction of those people now mixed, I think, somewhere here with this view of this model. Very sorry to a reproduction. Uh, other uses of models that might interest you, as I finish up here, I think. Um, one is uh, the full-scale simulation setting of the model. Uh, that is a room, the Road Research Lab in London, uh, where living by a freeway is projected on the window. That's a film. And living by a freeway or living by London Airport or something like that, whilst you're living, whilst you're in this uh, total a realistic full-scale mock-up room with television going and our chairs and whatnot. Uh, we have talked to them about projecting our simulations onto their simulation windows. Uh, Niagara Falls was the subject of now the U.S. Corps of Engineers makes a lot of models. Niagara Falls was the subject of a, of a full-scale, really large-scale model building project. You see that man there? They were concerned here about uh, uh, whether to clear up, and it's on the right hand side, very poor, whether to clear up the, uh, all those rocks at the bottom to clean it up and make it look like the Eucalyptus or whether to do an ecological contract to make it whole. Uh, and they did a lot of the debate and decision on a full scale, not a full scale, but a large scale model like that. Some cities build models of themselves. Stockholm is one here on the left. And every new project in the city of Stockholm gets built into the model, and so it's tested. Unfortunately, as you see, it's an abstract model, it's a white model, so that uh, you can't really tell whether a building of, uh, say, the wrong color would be destructive or not. But the idea is there. Um, I was uh, in Jerusalem a couple of years ago. Whoops, Jerusalem is just here, there. Uh, on the right-hand side there, yeah. Uh, the city of Jerusalem is now building a large-scale model of itself and will, in fact, use the simulator with a function and a hyper to simulate new fronts in the city, especially high-rise buildings. And the city of Vancouver is just about to build such a model. Um, that, I think, is going to end. I had a couple of pictures here of image analysis that I don't think uh, I'm going to talk about, except that it is possible to analyze the images you get to a simulator terms of, say, spatial enclosure and greenery and so on. And uh, this is all of these mentioned. I think I should stop now. I think that's the end anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have some questions. I'm going to show the movie later. <laughs>